This podcast is brought to you thanks to the generous support of Whistler Blackcomb, leaders in delivering adventure. So I was like, well, so I got to dig, dig down because his feet, you know, the snow's up to his knees. I dig down and then I looks and he everything looks fine. His skis, his boots are on this. Everything looks fine. I'm like, what's going on? And I'm like, okay, well, lift your foot. And he lifts his foot. And I'm like, do you feel this, Stuart? And he's like, what? And I'm like, I'm tickling the sole of your foot. So his entire sole of his boot had separated from the boot, was still in the binding. And I could literally see his sock. Welcome to Delivering Adventure. This is the podcast that explores what it really takes to share adventure like a pro with your friends, your family, and as a profession. My name is Chris Capio, and I'm coming to you from Whistler, British Columbia. And I'm Jordy Shepard, recording from Canmore, Alberta. After a lifetime of working extensively in different parts of the adventure guiding industry, Chris and I have teamed up to launch this podcast. In each episode, you will hear top adventure guides, managers, marketers, and athletes share their best stories, advice, and trade secrets. The goal of this podcast is to share how you can take yourself and others farther from the mountains to the office and beyond. In this episode, we look at how we can balance giving people what they want versus what they need. The conundrum of giving people what they want instead of giving people what they need is a challenge that many of us face when we're delivering adventure. This is even more challenging when there is a customer service element that comes with working in the adventure delivery industry as a professional. This topic was inspired by a very funny story that Ken Boulanger shared with us a few months ago. Instead of including Ken's story in his earlier episodes, we decided to share it here as we explore this topic in depth. Ken Melanger is an ACMG ski and hiking guide, avalanche educator, and the owner of Elevation Guides. Ken focuses on delivering custom skiing, hiking, and cycling adventures, as well as teaching avalanche courses. Ken has worked extensively throughout the guiding industry, and we encourage you to check out his earlier episodes where he discusses why people hire guides and how guides can provide exceptional value. So we're gonna share Ken's story first and then discuss a few key points afterwards. Here is Ken Belanger. So I was working for CMH uh, Heli Skiing and it was you know maybe my second season. I was still pretty green and you know, the customer's always right. And uh, when you, uh, working as a guide uh, like a lot of jobs you have to wear a lot of different hats and so the first day which we call exchange day when the new group flies in and the old group flies out it's pretty busy you've got 44 guests per week flying out and 44 guests flying in and probably 15 16 20 staff and a changeover and you've got avalanche training to do it's pretty busy so uh one of the things that all of the guides get trained in is ski tech how to be ski tech so how to set up everybody's uh, bindings because when people come heli skiing the standard in canada is they just show up with their clothing and their ski boots and we supply the skis and the poles because it's specific for heli skiing and that they're really big fat skis we know they're well trained um they're well uh, tuned so this guy comes up to me and he's Name was Stuart, I still remember. And Stuart was an Aussie, I, and he gives me these boots, and these boots are Solomon rear entry boots, which uh, if you, those of you have been skiing long enough, you know that those haven't been around for a long time. So they're definitely not validated. You're not supposed to be using these boots anymore. And I say to Stuart, I said, Stuart, we can't use these boots. Like these are, I mean, it is a lot of money to go heli skiing, particularly if you're flying from Australia. So it wasn't a, it wasn't that Stuart could not afford new boots. He loved these boots. He found them extremely comfortable. And I said, yeah, but Stuart, I look at them. They're, they're like, they, you can see when plastic goes white because it's, it's getting old and brittle. I was like, they're, they're toast. I can't. And the soles all worn down. They're not safe. And he's like, I, these are my boots. These are the only boots that work for me. I have to wear them. And I'm like, I tried a couple of times. I'm like, okay, the customer's always right. So I set up his skis and we go out and it just so happens that day. Cause we, there's, it's kind of random. 
sort of random. But anyways, Stuart's in my group that day. So the first day is crazy busy. Like I said, we do it. We do this avalanche training in this particular lodge in the Bugaboos. We actually try to get two runs, two or three runs in in the afternoon. So it's a pretty crazy day. They've traveled from Calgary that day, blah, 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 helicoptered in, got trained, all this stuff. And then we try to take them skiing the first day. There's a lot going on. Most of them are jet lagged, whatever. So we come in, it's midwinter, it's like February, we've got like 50 or 60 centimeters of blower power, it's fantastic skiing, it's going to be great skiing, we've got relatively good snow stability, so we can ski, you know, sometimes you get too much snow, you're locked down and where you can go. Um, And so we land, we get out of the machine, the machine flies away, we put our skis on, the guide goes first, it's me as usual, I ski down. 200 meters off a ridge down into the trees into a clearing to do a regroup because get away from the heli from the pad from the helicopter pad because the next group's going to be coming in within a few minutes and the group comes in and then Stuart goes kian there's something wrong with my boots with my bindings and i'm like what are you talking about and he said there's something wrong with my bindings and he's like i my foot's not really connected so i'm like well and i'm below him so i'm like 50 60 centimeters of powder so i it's hard work i sidestep back up to him and I'm what's telling him what's going on with your bindings. And then he's like, well, it just doesn't feel right. I feel my foot moving all over in the ski. So I was like, well, so I got to dig, dig down because his feet, you know, the snow's up to his knees. I dig down and then I looks and he's, everything looks fine. His skis, his boots are on this. Everything looks fine. I'm like, what's going on? And I'm like, okay, well, lift your foot. And he lifts his foot. And I'm like, do you feel this, Stuart? And he's like, what? And I'm like, I'm tickling the sole of your foot. So his entire sole of his boot had separated from the boot, was still in the binding. So the binding was doing a fantastic job of holding his sole of his holding the sole of his boot in place. And I could literally see his sock. Now we're at the point where we are in the field. We've got 48 people that we're trying to take heli skiing with one helicopter. And we obviously can't get Stuart down the hill without without new boots. So it's the first run of the first day. There's tons of powder. Everyone has powder fever. It's February. The days are short. We're running out of time, but I have to call and say, we need boots. So there's some backup, you know, there's some loner boots that they have just maybe not for this exact type of instance, but there are some loner boots. So the helicopter has to go back to the lodge. Someone has to run inside or run from outside to bring some boots for Stuart and get into the pilot. At this point, the helicopter doesn't have any guests in the machine because so the entire program shuts down because we're everyone is waiting so that we can get Stuart's boots because we can't move him off the mountain where he is. He's already started the run. We can't get him out of there. So the entire program is done. The helicopter flies back, dollar a second, more or less, to have a helicopter in the air and flies all the way back to lodge, brings the boot back, and the pilot's trying to figure out how to get the boots to me and ultimately it's not working. So ultimately he has to go and get another guide and now the guide has to get in the machine and then they go to that landing and then the guide gets out with the boots and the guide skis down and gives me the boots and then uh we then i got to set up the bindings and the field with all the snow everything like this so we're talking 30 minutes where nobody is heli skiing 50 centimeters of blower power and including the people in my group that I'm very aware of who nobody knew Stuart beforehand. It was a group that just came together. They're not happy with the situation, but you know, things happen. So set up Stuart's boots. We go skiing. Unfortunately, Stuart's not a great skier. So he's not, he's holding people back on the way down. So that's making things more stressful but we get the program running okay whatever we finish the day we less we get one less run everybody all 48 people get less one less run because of this boot debacle so that night i say okay Stuart, um you can use those boots for the week you know but i think it's fair to say you need new boots when you go home and he's like yes 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 he's like okay well uh he's like but yeah but i'm just gonna use one of the boots i want to use my other one still and I'm like, no, you're not doing that. This is not an option. You're not doing that, Stuart. Obviously, if one boot broke, the other one is very close to breaking. You can't have two totally different boots. And he's like, oh, long conversation. Okay, fine. So the next day, we rotate groups. The next day, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. And I hear another guy call the lodge. Stuart had taken his other boot. And that boot had broken as well. 
surprise and the entire program is to shut down so they can bring out this other boot for Stuart. And uh, let's say that when we got back to the lodge that night, uh, actually, actually at lunchtime, because we all get together for lunch, Stuart was the least popular person. Like the other guests were not happy. And so I was like, the only way you can solve this, Stuart, is you're buying wine for everyone tonight. And I don't know how much it's going to cost you, but I think that's the only way that you're going to get out of this, right? And so, yeah. So then the next day, he's like, I want to buy these new boots. They're fantastic. I want to buy these boots. It's like, you can't buy these boots. They belong to the lodge. They have to stay in the lodge because of this kind of stuff happens. No, these are the best boots ever. They're way better than my other ones. And I'm like, no. Anyways. The Stewart story. It was very expensive so. for the wine, and he still didn't have a pair of functioning boots. Uh, he he had like, goggles. Like that he owned. He, he was oh, using yeah. the loaners, the goggles, but he still he had, didn't own the boots. The foam was all worn out, so it was snowing like crazy, and he wore glasses, and his, his goggles, like, the, they would like, they would moisture in, so everything would fog on him. And so I was like, Stuart, you need new goggles, you know? Uh, and he's like, it's okay, I have another pair. So he, the next day he comes out with another pair that are just as old and just as beat up and everything. And I'm like, why don't you go to the boutique and buy yourself like a brand new pair of good goggles? And he's like, no, 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 I'm not doing that. I'm not spending money. I'm like, you spent, I don't know, $25,000 on this trip and you're not going to spend a hundred bucks on a pair of goggles. He had three pairs of goggles. We went through the week. Like they all just basically fell apart on his face during the week. So yeah, that's uh there you go. Delivering adventure funny. at its finest. Delivering, delivering adventure. Yeah. Chris, what comes to mind when you hear that story? Oh, well, Jordy, this could have easily been a case study in human factors and decision making, which is a subject we explored with Mike Adolf in episode six of this season. Looking at Ken's situation, though, I've been in a similar position several times. When I was guiding week long hiking trips in the Rockies, there were a number of times when people's equipment fell apart and I encountered resistance when I suggested they go out and replace it instead of having them try to MacGyver it back together in a fashion that was probably not going to work. There was one three-week period where someone's boots fell apart on the first hike of the week. In fact, by the time one guy finished his first hike of the trip, the soles of both of his boots had completely fallen off. He basically arrived at the van wearing a pair of glorified socks. This is actually quite common. Some people use a big trip as an excuse to buy new clothing or equipment. Other people can end up feeling that once they have purchased the trip, they have invested all the money they are willing to spend. Even when investing 5% more would increase their enjoyment of the trip by, say, 20%. Renting better skis is a great example. Another one is taking the extra tour or taking a lesson. So, Jordy, you must have had some similar experiences where you had to balance what people wanted versus what they needed. Yeah, Chris, I've got one from my guiding days. I, uh, I'll, I'll take a look at this from more of the perspective of the value proposition that we offer our clients. And they don't necessarily even know that we are offering that to them at the time, but they definitely uh, are quite happy and respect it later on. I was guiding a woman uh, on a private ice climbing day south of Jasper in the south part of Jasper National Park near the Columbia Ice Fields. And it's uh, not a difficult climb, but it's got multiple pitches to it. And she was uh, really wanting to upper game in terms of climbing stuff that was longer and so we got to the top of pitch i think it was pitch three the top of the climb and so i'm at the belay and i'm bringing her up and she is close to the top and she powers out and she's frustrated with herself she is done she's hanging on the rope and well actually refusing to hang on the rope and just getting more tired and i so i coached her i was just right there i could almost touch her uh, from the belay where the ice uh, let off in the angle at the top of the climb. And so I, I just gave her a moment and then I knew she could do it. I totally knew she could do it. And I knew that she would be upset at herself and possibly upset at me for not for allowing her not to finish the climb. 
And so I said, let's just take a, take a rest here. Uh, you know, we're not in a big rush. We don't have hazard above us. Uh, we've got some time here. It's a nice day. And uh, just take a breather. So she did. She got herself uh, sorted out uh, mentally and physically because there's a couple components to it. And she totally finished the climb. And afterwards, I recall she actually wrote into the guiding association and uh, there was a letter published in our, our guiding newsletter about her experience there. And in particular, about how I knew what she could do. She didn't know what she could do, but I knew what she needed to, to complete there. And she did. And it was a great trip. Yeah, that's a great example, Jordy. I think a lot of us have been in that situation where we are trying to convince somebody to to do something, to push themselves a little bit farther, to accomplish something that maybe they don't think they can do. And it's a fine line trying to give them what they want, which is maybe to pull the plug and, and turn back or stop and to convince them to to keep going because we know that they can do it and they would appreciate it if they continued afterwards. So looking at Ken's story, what are some of the things that Ken did well? Chris, a number of things come to mind. First off, identifying problems early. So in this instance, Ken was bang on when he identified that Stuart's boots could cause a problem. Unfortunately for everybody, it turned out that he was right. In this case, the thing that caused the problem was related to equipment. Sometimes it could be someone's clothing or lack of their expectations, a lack of time, and so on. Looking for potential problems early and addressing them can save us a lot of grief. And really, talking about starting about earliness, start early, and then you don't run out of daylight at the end of the day. Secondly, have a backup plan. It's always good to have a fallback or escape plan just in case things don't go well. In this case, there were extra boots that Ken could get sent out to replace the client's broken boot. Was it ideal? No, but it did solve the problem and it was probably a lot better than any other option available to Ken in that moment. And it did allow the skiing to continue. A uh, third thing that I noted was recognizing what people think they want and what they really want. Ken recognized early on what the client thought he wanted while also recognizing what he really wanted but didn't know yet. What Stuart thought he wanted was to keep wearing the boots he was used to. What Ken realized that it was what the client really wanted was better boots that were less likely to break on the trip. The problem for Ken was that the client didn't know any different. This is a great example of status quo bias where people can be resistant to change. The problem for everyone involved is that what the client thought he wanted wasn't what he really needed. As it turned out, not only did his old boots fall apart when he was skiing, fixing the problem came with a significant cost. It cost his whole group ski time. He had to repair relationships with the people he was with, and on some level, this must have been quite embarrassing. Instead, what he really wanted was to wear newer, stronger, more comfortable boots that would function and allow him to enjoy his trip without leading to disruptions. Ken's challenge was convincing his client that what he thought he wanted wasn't what he really wanted. Lucky for us, because we got a great story out of it. Great points, Jordy, and it was a great story. So how do we manage giving people what they think they want versus what they really want and ultimately need? For those of us who find ourselves in Ken's position, the question often becomes, what are our options? Well, to me, there are four of them. I list them as persuasion, force, suffer, and hope. When it comes to persuasion, the strategies include reasoning with the people we are trying to convince, offering something better, and the one strategy that I often use is telling people that if they want to do something they shouldn't be doing, I let them know that they won't enjoy it. People generally don't like to do things that they won't enjoy. The one thing I try not to do is to tell people that they can't do it. If you tell someone they can't do it, it just becomes a red flag for some people and they will set out to prove you wrong. So when it comes to using force, some strategies include just saying no. 
Another strategy are rules. So for example, a trip could have a rule where there are no boots older than say 10 years. Another strategy is setting out a skills-based objective or proficiency level before doing something harder. So for example, you need to be able to make 10 turns in this amount of space, or you need to be able to paddle a canoe or a kayak in a straight line for 100 meters. When it comes to suffering, you can give people an opportunity to see it doesn't work on their own and then correct it if possible. This only works if it's safe and there's an escape route. And the last strategy is using hope. So when we use hope, we just go for it and hope that it works out. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. And Chris, I'd just like to add one technique in the persuasion category. If you have a way to very graphically, visually, strongly demonstrate to someone uh, what could be a po potential poor outcome of what they want to do, uh, for example, and to try and persuade them to, uh, to understand where you're coming from as a professional, you could, for example, in the ski guiding world, if you know that you're not going to these some of these bigger runs because of avalanche danger and layers in the snowpack, you could find a smaller area and stomp on that. And when that cracks out and runs with a small avalanche, it's very graphical for people to see, oh, we don't want to go to that bigger place that we thought we wanted to go to. As we go forward with this podcast, we will have some more episodes on how we can convince people to change their behavior, shape expectations, and manage conflict when it does arise. And one last thing, this story was a great example of storytelling. Ken's story is a perfect example of a small misadventure that created a great story to tell for all. After all, we aren't talking about Bob and Susan who were on the same trip. This was something that Moose Mudlow touches on in a future episode. We will finish this episode off here. If you have a story you would like to share, reach out to us anytime. You can find our contact details in the show notes. We sincerely thank Ken for sharing this awesome story with us. And if you haven't already done so, check out his previous two episodes. There's a lot of golden insights in them. If you would like to join Ken on a guided trip or instructional course, so that you can hear more of his awesome stories, you can contact him through elevationguides.ca. We'll post the link in the show notes. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your social network. Take care and thanks for listening.